It is indeed a pleasure for me to welcome Senator Cory Booker to the summit. You know, I don't really know, uh, you know, if he needs any introduction. I mean, he's been working tirelessly, as you all know, to support and help candidates from the party. And he has been exceptionally helpful to our community and to, uh, and to impact. I'm sure all of you know his background. Um, you know, with his, uh, with his uh, education, with his charismatic personality, with his uh, uh, conversational skills, communication skills, I think he could have done anything that he wanted. And we are just lucky that he decided on public service. We are very, very lucky. He keeps fighting for us every day to have a more inclusive America, uh, an America that works for all of us, not just few folks, uh, for a uh, more just society, for a better criminal justice system, and many other key initiatives. And also, you know, in this difficult climate, you know, he's been unusually successful in reaching across the aisle and working with his colleagues, you know, on both sides. So let me just a quick story, yes. if I if I can. I mean, so I've had the privilege of knowing him for for a few years now, and I've got a few notes, handwritten notes from the senator, you know, at my house over the last you know few years. Um, and said, so I just want to let you know that my wife Nira has been saving them. And the reason why she's saving them, because she tells me that she'll be able to show them off when you are the president of the United States of America. So, a pleasure to welcome Senator Booker. Hello, everybody. I, I I cannot tell you how good it is to be invited here as your only non-Indian speaker. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, that makes me feel very special. Uh, I feel like I have an honorary status amongst you. And uh, I, I therefore make you all, anybody here who is not from New Jersey, I will, in, in recipro reciprocity, I'm gonna give you all honorary New Jersey status for those of you not Jersey folks. Um, this is such an important gathering. I cannot uh, communicate to you enough how from the first time Deepak told me uh, about impact and the idea behind it, how urgently important I, I thought it was. And we see the Indian American community uh, uh, really leading this country in areas of uh, culture, in areas of business, in areas of academia. But the one big hole in American society where we have not seen uh, the kind of dynamism, the kind of imagination, the kind of expertise being manifested has been in the political sphere. Uh, in every area, um, uh, the Indian American community is out punching its weight class. In every area, look at the list of Fortune 500 companies. In every area, Indian Americans are out punching their weight class except for one, and that has been in elected officials. And it's a time that we so urgently need Indian American leadership, not just because of what the, the, the dynamism that's being brought to the other sectors of American society, but also because this is a time when the very idea of America is under assault. We see our democratic institutions under assault. We see bigotry being spouted from the highest offices in the land. And please understand, that trickles all the way down. Hate crimes against Indian Americans are up 45% in one year alone since November of 2016. We have a time now where Indian American pride where Indian American strength, where Indian American ideas are critically needed. And I have to say, this has been a good year for America. It's been a great year for New Jersey. Uh, Mayor Ravi Bala, who is here, who is a dear friend of mine. Uh, I cannot tell you what it meant to me to stand up in such a historic city and to stand next to uh, Ravi Bala, who's uh, unapologetic in who he is, from his uh, Sikh faith uh, uh, to his uh, racial ethnicity, and to have him stand up there and be so proudly, uh, not just American, but proudly New Jersey, not just New Jerseyan, but literally if you cut him, he bleeds Hoboken. Um, 
And, and the fact that, that he was just one of 16 Indian Americans elected in that election uh, uh, in, in the state of New Jersey, to me, is something that we should all be thrilled about. We, we please go ahead. So I, I've really come to, to give you guys uh, some excitement and enthusiasm to the urgency of this moral moment in our country. And to really help you all, hopefully, are going to be leaving here with enthusiasm and understand, hey, yeah, from tech to the arts to business, Indian American dominance is helping America. But the one area that we have to lean into and be more engaged in is in that civic space where policy, where ideas are being shaped. And not only do it from uh, the local levels, but from a local level, state levels, to even the federal level, to make sure that the voice of this community, the spirit of this community is felt. Now, I came to Washington, D.C., and there's lots of caucuses. There's a caucus for everything. Uh, uh, only a few caucuses have been able to be established. I've tried to establish a bald man's caucus, but nobody wants to join me. Uh, thank you, thank you. We'll talk afterwards. Maybe a subsection of, of impact can be bald brown <laughs> But the very first caucus I joined was the Indian American Caucus. And I, and I did that because I know what the future looks like, and I know the urgency of this community. But I want to take a moment to talk about the past. Um, if you walk into my office right now, and you look towards the Capitol, there's two pictures that are right by my window, one on one side, the other on the other side. One is Gandhi, one is Martin Luther King. And I, I say that. I bring that out because the two of them, to me, represent and preached the very things that we are in a moral moment that we need now more than ever. And this is this idea of a beloved community. That we in America are at a point now where we more than ever need to create a sense of a beloved community. This understanding that we need each other in this nation. That we have interwoven destinies. Actually, that when we come together, we create a better outcome. As uh, a great African saying says, if you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together. This nation, I, I want to get everybody out of the idea that this is a country that uh, should subscribe to some kind of great man theory of America. That, are, that somehow we are where we are because of these great men that descended from Mount Olympus, uh, 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 Jefferson, Adams, uh, Lincoln, even King. We are here because of folk like the ones in this room, small gatherings of Americans that committed themselves to the call of our country. Sometimes they met in church basements for the civil rights movement. Sometimes they met in barnyards, plotting the greatest infrastructure project this country's ever seen, the Underground Railroad. Sometimes they met in storefronts, talking about workers' rights. We are a nation where groups and gatherings like this are the essential thing to change the course of human events. And our country was founded upon this idea of the beloved community. And let me, let me push that a little further. This country was broke with the course of human events to found a nation not based upon tribalism or ethnicity. If you look at the very boundaries of nations around the globe, they're often decided because everybody prays the same way. They're often decided because everybody is from the same tribe or the same ethnicity. But this was a country that said, we're not going to be a theocracy. We're not going to be a, 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 a ethnic state. That we are going to be the first, with the oldest constitutional democracy, we're going to be the first nation that puts forward a country based upon ideas and principles that are so much bigger than even the people that, that wrote them down. Our founders were geniuses, but they were trapped in the bigotry and the hatred of the time. I mean, look at the Declaration of Independence. It calls Native Americans savages. It doesn't refer to women at all. African Americans were considered in our Constitution fractions of human beings. But the greatness, the genius of our founders was that they said this nation will be formed not because we all speak the same language, look alike, pray alike, but because we have a commitment to ideas and principles like liberty and justice, like equality under the law and the rule of law. And what has been the, 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 the truth of America is that every generation has had to do something to make real on the promise of this country, to make us more perfect in our representation of our ideals. Now that takes a lot. 
it, it takes, what our founders saw was a unique commitment one person to another. And in fact, it is an unusual commitment if you don't have the natural ties of, 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 of racial solidarity or tribal solidarity, ethnic solidarity, religious solidarity, they're the normal ties of human beings. If we were gonna to try to bound a country by ideas, it would necessitate an unusual commitment to one another. And that's why in the Declaration of Independence, they actually end with a declaration of interdependence. They talk to these ideals of us needing each other and needing to make a commitment to each other. The final words of the Declaration of Independence say, we must mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Now, now think about that, those words, the commitment that this country needs. This idea of pledging our sacred honor to each other, it necessitates an engagement and involvement with the lives of each other. And for us to surrender any space, especially the civic space, especially politics, where every issue affecting from the healthcare decisions we can make with our own bodies all the way to business decisions, for us not to be fully engaged is to surrender that commitment of sacred honor. But more than this, more than this, if you think about what sacred honor is, it's the very ideas of a beloved community. We can't let this country ever become a country where the highest standard is tolerance. Oh yeah, we have lots of difference in this country and I tolerate people. This person may pray a different way, I'm just tolerating them. This person may look different than me, I'm tolerating them. That's my highest call. Right? We gotta tolerate each other in America. I reject tolerance as the standard in this country because it doesn't reflect those founding ideals. Tolerance says I'm just stomaching your right to be different. If you disappear off the face of the earth, I'm no worse off or better off. What we're called to do by the ideals of this country is to manifest that sacred honor. I call that love. Love says I see you, I see your worth, I see your value. Love says that I know that if your children don't get a great public education, good health care, if they don't get a chance to nurture their genius, that I'm bereft of that genius. That if your kid becomes a scientist or an innovator or a teacher, my kid will be better for it. Tolerance says I couldn't care less. Love says I couldn't care more. Tolerance says I'm just gonna cross the street when you're walking down, down. Love confronts and embraces. Tolerance builds fences and walls. Love tears them down. And I'm going to tell you right now, there's never been in my lifetime a chance when these conflicting ideals hang in the balance where Americans are spewing hatred. And I'm not just talking about hatred directed towards Muslims or Mexicans or Chinese. I'm talking about hatred coming from Democrats to Republicans and Republicans to Democrats just because we think different. Heck, if you're in New Jersey, you remember when you were watching the Republican presidential primaries, that Chris Christie was being lambasted by other Republican presidential candidates for the sin of hugging Barack Obama. And when did that hug happen? He was coming in on Air Force One, the president, walking down the stairs after Hurricane Sandy. And the two men hugged. And, and you saw it with me and Deepak, I'm a hugger, and it wasn't even that good of a hug, those two men. It was one of those awkward men hugs, they didn't know what to do with your hands, you know? <laughs> do I pull them too close? No, come on. <laughs> I, when John McCain came to the Senate floor, after getting a terminal cancer diagnosis, I, I crossed the aisle in front of the C-SPAN cameras, so 24 Americans saw me, and, <laughs> <laughs> and I hugged John McCain. By the time I got home that night, I was getting lambasted on Twitter by people on the left. How could you hug that man? Are we the beloved community today? Are we the community that understands that we're all in this together? Are we the community that understands, like Angela Davis, who's in prison for her political beliefs, James Baldwin, the great African American author, wrote to her saying, if they come for you in the morning, then they're gonna come for me at night. We are in this moment in our country where institutions like the free press, where, where institutions like 
like free speech were, were ideals that we need each other, where the call to be a beloved community is, is unfortunately being eroded. I know the Indian community in New Jersey intimately. I know the Indian Americans I meet around this country. If there's anybody else more committed to the ideals of this country, you see it in the Indian community. And know consciously that what we're doing right now is hurting us. If we become a community where bigotry flows from highest office in the land, that starts shutting its borders. I had the president of Stanford University in my office and saying to themselves, I don't understand this. We have some of the brightest minds on the planet Earth coming in to study in our country. And as soon as they finish getting their degrees in things that half of Congress can't spell, <laughs> as, soon as, as soon as they finish their, their degrees, we kick them out of our country. Because we're becoming a country that's turning on its ideals, turning on its history. And that's where this room is so important. That's why what you're doing is so critical. You may underestimate this, but I promise you, often the biggest thing you can do in any day is a small act of kindness, of decency, of love. Writing a check to this organization isn't about politics. Supporting this organization is about America. Is committing yourself that I will support leaders and individuals who will represent the best of who we are. I, I want to end with just a story that I used to only know half of it. I just told the story this week to Princeton graduates. And, and it really is the story of a beloved community of people being committed to that. Because when my family was here in DC, this is where I was born. I was born here in 1969 and we were moving to to go to New Jersey, but they would not show black families homes in northern New Jersey suburbs. And my parents would show up to look at a house and they would say the house was sold. And so my, my parents found this group of Americans, black and white, different faiths, small group, but had this idea that they were not gonna let this happen. And they started with a group of incredible lawyers set up a sting operation to send out, to send out white couples right behind my parents, and they would go and find out that the house was still for sale after my parents had been told it was sold. And on the house that my parents fell in love with, the house I would grow up in, they come in, my parents were told the house, I'm sorry, this house has been taken off the market or sold. My parents left, the white couple came, found out it was still for sale. The white couple had been instructed to put a bid on the house. The bid was accepted. Papers were drawn up, and on the day of the closing, the white couple didn't show up. My father did in a volunteer lawyer. And, and, and they, they walk into the real estate agent's office and the real estate agent sits there surprised. The lawyer makes this civil rights speech or in violation of New Jersey fair housing law. It starts going on, but the real estate agent's not gonna have any of it. He stands up and punches my dad's lawyer in the face. And then he sigs a dog on my dad. And let me tell you something, every time my dad would tell the story as I was growing up, the dog would get bigger. <laughs> Eventually, when I was 18 years old, he was like, boy, I had to fight a pack of wolves to get you in this house. <laughs> Walk around this house like you hit a triple, you were born on third base, young man. <laughs> and so this is the story I do all my life. I told this story, it's a family story. I knew when I came here to the United States Senate, and I, I became a senator, and like lots of senators who have high self-regard for themselves, I said, I'm gonna write a book. And so I went to go do research. If you have a family like mine, a dad like mine, you gotta fact check every story. <laughs> and so I go into New Jersey to try to find the head of the Fair Housing Council from the 1960s. She was easy to find because she is still head of the North Jersey Fair Housing Council today. Her name is Miss Lee Porter. She is 92 years old. Now she doesn't represent, she doesn't represent Black families, she represents same-sex couples. She represents families who are Muslim, who are sick. 
And, and she told me these incredible stories. She confirmed everything with me, but I wanted to talk to these lawyers, so she sent me to go to the lawyer who organized everything, the lawyer, the granddaddy lawyer who brought everybody together. And so I call him up. He's a retired judge. He's 84 years old. And I, his name is Arthur Lesman, and I go, sir, I'm Cory Booker. I know who you are. <laughs> and we have this incredible conversation. He confirms more of the facts. It was not a pack of wolves. <laughs> But this is what knocked me over. And this is what I want you to think about. He, I ask him why. Why would he go out of his way to help black families move into his community? Why would this white guy who has just started a business, was busy as you can imagine, why would he go out of his way to start helping black families? Why? And what he said to me blew me away. He said, I remember the day I made the decision. I go, was it July, this? No, it was the day. I mean, Corey, it was a Monday. And I was like, okay, it was a Monday. You remember the day of the week? He goes, absolutely. And I go, why? He goes, well, because that Sunday, I was sitting at home, comfortable on my couch, watching TV. And guess what he was watching? He was watching, and this was 1965, when we only had like three and a half TV stations. <laughs> And so most of America was watching this movie called Judgment at Nuremberg. It, it, a powerful film. The aftermath of the Holocaust. And, and he's watching this film and then something rare happens. They cut away from the movie to show Alabama. Something's going on in Alabama. And he leads forward and he basically sees these marchers who started in Selma and were trying to march to Montgomery to protest what? Voting rights. And he watches them get stopped on this bridge, this famous bridge, the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And they were stopped by Alabama state troopers armed with weapons and billy clubs and gas. And the marchers realized they can't go forward, so they're going to turn around and go back. But the first thing they decided to do was to kneel and pray. And just as they're going down to kneel and pray, the Alabama State Troopers shot tear gas into them, gassing them, and then stormed in with their billy clubs open, bashing the heads of these marchers. A woman named Boynton, a man named Lewis, Heads fractured, blood everywhere. This man on the couch in New Jersey watching this scene was so horrified, he couldn't believe that this was his country in the backdrop of judgment at Nuremberg, that this was going on in America, that this was a moral moment in his country. And he couldn't just sit still. He couldn't get stuck in a state of sedentary agitation. He got up. And went to work the next day, told his partner, Leo, we got to go to Alabama. Leo and him laughed, not because it was funny, but because it was preposterous. They couldn't afford a ticket, not to mention to close their business. And so they just sat there for a little while and didn't make the mistake that we've all made sometimes, which is to allow your inability to do everything to undermine your determination to do something. They didn't do what all of us do sometimes, falling into that trap of Alice Walker, who says the most common way people give up their power is not realizing they have it in the first place. He, he just sat there and then he decided those powerful 10 two-letter words that we all should say to ourselves regularly, those 10 two-letter words that are necessary to make the big changes in life, which is simply, if it is to be, it is up to me. They just sat there and finally decided, you know what, why don't we just do the best we can with what we have, where we are, and they got on the phone calling around to see who needed lawyers to help with an issue of civil rights or voting rights or housing rights or anything, and they found a woman named Miss Lee Porter, a very young woman at the time, who like said, thank you Jesus, this is mana from heaven, I'm desperate for some legal help. And here these guys went to work with her and four years later, they get a file handed to them of this couple that desperately needed help, and the name on the file was Carrie and Carolyn Booker, my parents. Think about this chain reaction right now. 
Think about this virtuous virus, this cascade that happened from marchers who stood up on a bridge that affected a man a thousand miles away on a couch in New Jersey that would go on and change the outcome for generations not yet born. I would not be a United States Senator. I would not be here today if this chain reaction didn't go and it opened up a town and a community for me and my family. And what is this power that leapt up a thousand miles, changed the heart, and unleashed the actions of these men on, on families like mine? What is that power that has the power to leap space and time? What is that power that great saints and activists have talked about? What is that power so represented by those two men's picture who stand, sit, hangs in my office? What is that power? Some people call it patriotism. I do because patriotism is the right word. Patriotism isn't a flag pin. It isn't how strong, tall you stand when the songs are sung. Patriotism isn't the symbols of patriotism. What is the substance of patriotism? I have this saying where I say, before you tell me about your religion, first show it to me and how you treat other people. Well, I'm gonna tell you right now, before you tell me about how much you love your country, Show it to me in how much you love your country, men and women, because patriotism is love of country, and you cannot love your country unless you love your country, men and women. And that power that they showed on that bridge, that patriotism, which is love, is what is needed right now. In this room of patriots, in this room of people who are committed to the cause of this country, in this room are people who know we have not yet become who we say we are, a nation of liberty and justice for all. In this room, people know there are folks that are still struggling. In this room, folks that know that the sin of poverty exists in our country and abroad. In this room, there are people that know what King said, that we are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a common garment of destiny. That in this global world, an Ebola breakout in, in the Democratic Republic of Congo is a threat to us. In this world, poverty in India is a threat to security in the United States of America. In this world, a child in Newark who does not get a good education is a hurt to the nation as a whole who will not be the benefit of their genius. And so I ask everyone in this room, not to swear your oath to this country with your hand over your heart, but to do it with your hand outstretched, giving, helping, healing. And I end with the poem of a man who called upon us to do this, called upon us as a poet, and I believe this nation needs more poets, not in the literal sense, but people who every day will do poetic acts of justice. This is the oath that this man called upon us all to do, to swear an oath to this country. And this is what he said to poets Langston Hughes. He said, oh, let America be America again, the land that never has been yet, but yet must be the land where everyone is free, the poor man, the Indian, the Negro, me. And who made America, whose sweat and blood whose faith and pain, whose hand at the foundry, whose plow in the rain must make our mighty dream live again. Oh yes, I say it plain, America never was America to me. And yet, I swear this oath, America will be. Swear that oath with me, that we will make our nation live up to its values and ideals. Swear that oath with me that in this moral moment we will not be silent because the opposite of justice is not injustice. It's silence, it's apathy, it's indifference. Swear the oath with me that we will join together, invest together, and elevate the next generation of leaders that this country desperately deserves. And I promise you, if you swear that oath, if you act in this manner, that your deed will not stop in a finite way, 
that like an infinite act of love, no matter how small, it will leap space and time, and you and I together will change the outcome for generations not yet born. Thank you.